Now he's on this show, and very welcome to Stephen Fry. <laughs> I didn't mention your latest role, of course, um, Best Man. Oh, yes, well, that's true, yes. I had a rather strange experience the other, the other week, which was a day trip to New York. I expect you've done that a lot in your oh. jet-setting life, but it's not something I've ever done before. Um, you get on a plane in the morning, and it uh, whisks you over there, and uh, a friend, well, uh, Rowan Atkinson, was, was, was getting married, and he wanted very much to keep it a secret from the, uh, the bloodhounds of the press, so he uh, decided to do it in America. So I, I joined him. And it was completely secret. It was a lovely little chapel in uh, uptown New York, as we cosmopolitan types call it. Um, <laughs> and Billy Joel as well calls it that. I think he copied that from me, in fact. And um, <laughs> it was absolutely no press. It was lovely. I had a little Super 8 camera and uh, recorded the whole thing. And then we went to celebrate with the wedding breakfast at the Russian Tea Rooms, which is a large lunch house, as you can tell from the name, which is American. <laughs> and. Um, uh, it was all going fine, and there were two British people dining there who, who rang up newspapers immediately in England to say that it looked as if Rowan Atkinson had just got married. What Terrible rotters. treachery. I know, beastly. There were television executives as well. It makes you think. <laughs> <laughs> it was all your fault anyway, wasn't it? The whole wedding? Well, it, in a way it was, yes. It was um, the, 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 the bride um, was the makeup art, my makeup artist, I like to think, on Blackadder 2. And she it was who stitched on lovingly um, every hair of my long beard as Lord Melchett in Blackadder 2. And um, I was just summoning up courage to ask her to go out and eat with me because I don't sort of, you know, do things with um, other people very much of that kind because it's not nice, it's rather dirty. <laughs> and, uh, but I thought I'd make an exception in her case because she's a very splendid creature. And, and he got there one day before I'd summoned up the courage. It'd take me two weeks to go <clears throat> like that. Can you, would you consider possibly... And then I'd lose confidence and say, Pass it, passing the comb. And, um, <laughs> and so I lost a chance. But uh, she's gone to a better person. Well, it all ended happily in, exactly. in the end. You're rehearsing a, a new play, Look, Look. Tell me, tell me. <laughs> about it. That's a little bit of a gag from you there, isn't it? It's, right. it's, <laughs> well, it's what, better than the other. Right? What the world of charming television presenters has gained, the world of comedy has lost, I can see. Well, <laughs> Look, Look <laughs> is, uh, is a new play by, by Michael Frayn, um, who wrote Noises Off and uh, uh, Benefactors, and lots of good, very good uh, West End comedies. And I don't know if you ever saw Noises Off. Yes. It, was, um, it was a sort of a play within a play. Well, this is, this is a play within a play within a play within a play. And we're in the fourth day of uh, rehearsing at the moment. And it is impossible to understand the script, if you can imagine. It is written in two columns uh, in, for the entire second act because two things are going on simultaneously on stage. But it's not that you've got one group saying things and another group saying things. It's the same group saying things as different characters all the time. So um, it's as if you're talking to yourself a lot of it, being like a ventriloquist dummy. You're sort of saying one line out here and then speaking like that again, and then one out like here in two different characters. You go by me. Well, uh, yes, I fully intend to. It, it is... Um, <laughs> it's astonishing. Well, I, I, hope it'll be, I hope it'll be splendid, but it is extraordinarily difficult to rehearse. The last time you were in the West End was with Common Pursuit, wasn't it? That's right. And that was about students. And didn't you take the cast on a day trip as an That's e right. educational... Well, you know, I, I felt a bit sort of schoolmasterly, but we had uh, John Gordon Sinclair, John Sessions, uh, Rick Mail, and myself in, in the cast of this play. And uh, a lot of it was set in Cambridge, and I'd had the good fortune to have been educated to some extent. Uh, one of many places. The only place I think I've ever been educated in from which I was not expelled, so that's, I have a particular <laughs> fond memory for Cambridge. I don't know how I, how I slipped through the expulsion net, but I managed to. So I thought I'd take them all, all over to see the place. And, um, of course, Rick... <laughs> Rick Mail in, in good form is not someone to be let loose on the manicured lawns of Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> He's a man who knows no shame. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, I'm quite a shy sort of fellow, and if I'm wandering along a street and I see somebody, I instantly look away like any normal Englishman would. But, um, <laughs> Rick, you know, we, so we go into this college and say, and this is Trinity College and it's very large and um, that's that gate and this is a chapel and um, that's this, and anyway, we'll go away to the next one now. But he would see a group of undergraduates coming and go, hey, hi, like this, and just wave at them. And they'd go, because they're trying to be cool. Is that Rick Mail? Actually, it might be Rick Mail. I'm not sure. I think it could be. Is it Rick Mail? Yeah, it's Rick Mail, actually. Okay, let's be really cool and just say hi as if we know him. Okay, and so they go, hi back. And, you know, five minutes later, you're in a bar with 30 undergraduates all take, <laughs> telling their life story to Rick. He's an astonishing character. But he's a disgrace. He is a disgrace. <laughs> okay. 
very glad to hear it. Yes. <laughs> now, your own, uh, dare I use the word, image is of a sort of a tweedy, avuncular fellow. Mm. Um, but I was going to say, your background, in fact, is not of the English squirearchy at all, is it? No, it isn't. Um, I, I'm sort of rather pleased and, and proud that it is, in a way, because I think that if you... Somehow, people who are slightly not English tend to be more English than, than the English, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. They sort of embrace the culture more, they find the language more interesting, more mystifying. My, on my, fa on the, my father's side of the family, it's a, it's a very old Quaker family. Um, it, um, it stopped being Quaker around some time uh, last century. But my mother's family is entirely Jewish, um, sort of middle Europe Jewish. Uh, my grandfather was from Hungary, and my grandmother from Austria, which was in fact all one country in those days. Uh, but uh, no, I'm, I'm very pleased to be Jewish. My, my grandfather used to tell what I thought was a rather splendid story. Uh, he was very, very rare for, 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 for a Jew. He was uh, mad on horses, and uh, he was a cavalry officer in what were called the uh, uh, the Blue Hussars, who were the uh, the emperor of, of Austro-Hungary's sort of personal bodyguard. And they had silver spurs, and they were real chocolate soldiers. And they they rode against the Serbian guns in the very first week of the war. You know, expecting with their sort of twirling moustaches and sabers that they would get rid of Serbia straight away, and that would be the end of the war. As we know, it lasted for four years and gave rise to... Perhaps the worst thing that happened gave rise to Blackout against Forth, but it also other, other <laughs> unpleasant things resulted from it. Um, and so he rapidly became very disillusioned and was holed up in the Carpathian Mountains on, one of the, on the eastern front there, having a miserable time, and a shell exploded quite near him. And he thought, that's it, that's it, yep, that's it, I've had it with this war, it's bad. So he pretended to have a bit of shell shock. I'm going to do this a lot. You know? <laughs> and, um, and so some officers said to him, well, you'd better go and see the shell shock expert in Vienna. So he said, okay, I'll go and see him. So he went to see the, the officer's shell shock expert who lived in Vienna and had a nice office. And my grandfather said, so I went in and I was shaking away and he was looking at me and saying, yeah, I think maybe we sign a piece of paper. So he signed a piece of paper. My grandfather was sent off to look after a remand division in Romania for the rest of the war. And he used to end the story and say, and that was the only time I ever met Sigmund Freud. And that's what it was. So I owe my life to old Freud. I am a Freudian slip in many ways. <laughs> With all that you've told us and all that one can see of you, uh, it's difficult to believe that you were a jailbird. Mm, yes, well, once a jailbird, always a jailbird, really. Um, yes, I, I was a, a, an appalling adolescent. I mean, there's no getting away from it. I was a trial to my parents and very nearly brought their grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. Um, so I was expelled from a, a first school and then another one and then, and then another and then ran away and, and got mixed up in credit cards in some unfortunate way uh, and was um, apprehended by the police in Swindon, the, the Wiltshire Hotel Swindon. So I was then, then sent off to Puckle Church Romant Home in, in Avon, which is a lovely prison, really. And we had a visit, it's a very stupid thing, but we had a visit from the Bishop of Bath and Wells, who was the local bishop. Bishops are always funny, um, obviously. Um, and, um, <laughs> and then he asked if we were all happy. And there was a usual silence, because, you know, the, the prison officers stiffened behind you. You know, no one is going to dare say they're not happy here, are they? You know, that sort of thing, Fletcher, and all that. And um, uh, so... They all stiffened, and I said, well, I do have a complaint. And the, and the prison officers were going, right, what are you going to say? And uh, he, said, he said, oh, yes. I said, um, it's, it's the soap that Her Majesty's government chooses for us here at Puckle Church. Her Majesty's regulation issue soap. I said, yes, is there a problem with it? And uh, I said, well, it's, um, it doesn't lather, it doesn't float, it doesn't smell nice. All it can be said to do is keep you company in the bath. <laughs> and, um, he stared at me and said, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do with the Home Office. And, and uh, c completely baffled, obviously. I mean, you don't, you know. And um, so, so he then came up to me uh, afterwards and said, I, I always promised myself, I'd never ask this whenever I visited a prison, but what are you in here for? <laughs> obviously very baffled. But you see, they don't expect their own kind to be in prison. And uh, it, it's, it's still a class-ridden place, bless it. Well, I... I'm glad you've turned your back on crime, if indeed you have. Uh, we'll <laughs> pause uh, while uh, Stephen dashes off a few poems. Your wallet, back I think. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly nice. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.